the planning process is as it should be under constant review and we must not feel shy of initiating new approaches to planning perspectives after 50 years of independence the tangible benefits of planning are yet to reach the millions of our countrymen living in the remote rural areas the quality of life presently available to the economically weaker and vulnerable sections of our society among whom are the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes needs to be improved without delay the end result of planning should be monitored and evaluated so as to ensure that there is a noticeable shift in emphasis from the urban to the rural areas and from the better off sections of society to those unfortunate brethren who constitute a silent majority only then can we take pride that our planning effort has been realistic and worthwhile any effort in this direction i have indicated cannot possibly be fruitful unless the administration which is to implement these socio economic programs is in tune with the underlying spirit of this planning exercise and responds with sympathy understanding and a sense of urgency to the tasks given to it only then will the needs of the common man particularly of the economically weaker and more vulnerable sections of society in the remote rural areas come nearer solution after 50 years of independence in adequate housing communications health and medical care and essential commodities at reasonable prices continue to be beyond the reach of the millions of our countrymen we need to search our herds to locate immediate and long term shortfalls in reaching the benefits of planning of the grassroots of our society our planners are now engaged in putting a realistic result oriented rural bias into our plans for socio economic development the recent announcement with regard to the industrial policy with emphasis on the employment oriented small scale industries and the extension of credit facilities to such industries and to small farmers in the agricultural sector is welcome This is an area where the governors of states could use their good offices at all level to advise encourage and caution those engaged in this gigantic nation building exercise our youth are the trustees of prosperity and the institutions where we seek to impart to them the values of life and our cultural heritage apart from fitting them out for more mundane duties and responsibilities in later life our planners are thinking in terms of providing increased employment opportunities and to tackle the question of both existing unemployment and underemployment in all walks of life this is an herculean task we must therefore at the national level evolve a consensus as to what employment opportunities can be created and what would be the contribution of such an exercise for the national welfare only thus can we hope to eliminate the growing discontent in the younger generation who are slowly getting disenchanted with their prospects for the future i have every hope that we in this country will go in for mass programs of self employment so that our youth will learn to seek opportunities for gainful self employment and thus relieve the pressure in traditional occupations like government service etc our resources are not ulti- unlimited and it is necessary for us to implement urgently a program of austerity and economy where ever possible eliminate wasteful expenditure and thus ensure that the maximum benefit is derived out of every rupee of revenue earned there are of course traditionally prescribed methods and practices for dealing with these problems but in all such matters which ultimately tend to become routine and mechanical example is better than perspect and there needs to be an awakening of individual conscience if at all we are to achieve the highest standards of moral rectitude and honesty in national life i have been concerned for some time with our inability to control the price line even in respect of essential commodities without which life for the common man can become an unbearable burden 
Apart from punitive action, it is necessary to enlist the goodwill and cooperation of all sections of society and all those engaged in the production and distribution process to ensure that there is not only the fear of law but also moral restraint which places an obligation on all those of us who can help to reduce the scarcity of essential commodities and control their prices. I would particularly refer to lavish expenditure and show to extravagance among certain sections of our society which in the circumstances of today have no place in our way of life. The family planning program has unfortunately in the recent past acquired a poor reputation not because the program is in itself objectionable but because some of the methods adopted to force the pace have been unethical. Our population growth is to say the least alarming and try as we may, our resources cannot match this increasing pressure of population unless we consciously consciously recognize individually and severally the need to restrict our population growth which will destroy us. Mr. Chairman, for about 12 years or more now, I have been related first to rather distantly and then more intimately with the work of the Institute of Pacific Relations. I have profited by reading your publications and have always felt that you were doing good work in trying to understand the problems of the Pacific or the Far East. For a long time, I have felt that as times goes on the problems of the Far East will become more complicated and the center of gravity of the tension prevalent in the world today will shift to the Far East and in particular to Asia. While people readily agree that Asia has to a certain extent become a focal point of world tension, they relegate Asian problems to positions of relative insignificance and tend exit exclusively the emphasis the importance of European and other world problems. I agree that European problems are and have been very important but I have felt that in the perspective of things to come they were wrong in not devoting the requisite attention of the problems of developing Asia. Asia compels attention in many ways. There are a large number of backward countries in need of urgent economic development and others in which acute scarcity of vital commodities prevails. But what is most needed is an understanding that Asia is going through a process of change and that it is in ferment. Some parts of Asia are quiet and relatively peaceful whereas others are torn by external troubles and disturbances. I am not referring to the external situation so much as to the characteristic inherent in the personality of Asia. I do not claim that this change is peculiar to Asia, perhaps it is taking place all over the world. In Asia, we have been kept down and are now trying to catch up with others who are ahead of us. We have been engrossed of in things of the past and time has passed us by. We have not been able to keep pace with it and so we must run. We cannot afford to talk but then when we run we also stumble and fall and try to get up again. We realize that speed especially in an age old continent like Asia involves risk and dangers but we have no choice in the matter. If you seek to understand us, you can do so to a limited extent. Asia is a huge continent and the peoples of Asia are all different from one another as they were reared in different cultures and traditions. In spite of all this, I think it is still true to say that there is such a thing an Asian sentiment. Perhaps this sentiment is merely the outcome of the past 300 years of European influence in Asia. Personally, I do not believe that any profound difference exists between the Orient and the Occident. Such differences as can be accounted by history, tradition and geography exist even among the Asian countries and in fact even within the same country. Probably, the existing differences mainly arose from the fact that certain parts of the world developed their resources and became prosperous while others were completely unaffected by the Industrial Revolution. I think that thinking in terms of the Orient and the Occident sets us on the wrong track. As a rule, the same type of problems leads to the same results everywhere. 
At the same time, there are certain countries like India and China with pronounced national characteristics where history and tradition exert a profound influence on the course of events.